What is up, Bills Mafia? Welcome into our monthly live episode of Shout a Buffalo Bills Football Podcast. Brought to you tonight by Wing Nuts, and I am here with Ed and Alicia, the OGs, the creators of the most delicious chicken wings in Buffalo, New York, or anywhere, really. How are you guys? Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, first of all, how are you doing? We're here at 1402 Millersport Highway, the new official home of Wing Nuts, and we're a couple months in here. How's it going? This place is mobbed all the time. I can't be thankful enough. Um, YouTube, thankful for your show. Again, like I always do, thankful to God for the whole thing. Uh, AJ, Chris, everybody that works here, this place is absolutely awesome. Speaking of awesome, this is an awesome time of the offseason for Buffalo Bills football. There is a lot to talk about. We're going to get into so much. What's happened this week in free agency? I'm going to bring Ryan Talbot in here later tonight. What is to expect for the next couple of weeks as we kind of build toward the NFL draft? Before we get there, we start every live show at Wing Nuts with a little bit of a story. Because there's a lot of stories that come with the Wing Nuts experience. So what do you have for us this weekend? This, this week we're going to talk about what's called the fish story. When Alicia and I were at the Knights. By the way, this is a really good time for that because everybody gets fish fries this time of year. Yes, yes, that's why we Okay. Very nice. Um, the fish story goes back to the Knights of Columbus. Uh, Alicia and I were working alone. The place was pretty empty. And the door opened, and this lady came up to the counter, and she said to us, what kind of fish do you have? And I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, we don't serve fish. And she says, well, okay, but what kind is it? And I said, ma'am, you're not understanding. We do not sell fish. And she said, oh, so you're all sold out. And I'm like, no, ma'am. I said, we, we just don't have it. And this went on for a few minutes. And then the door opened again, and another lady came in, came up to the first lady, and the first lady said, I don't know what kind it is, but they're sold out. And I'm like, ma'am, you're not understanding it. We don't sell fish at all. And they're looking at each other, and they're like, well, what kind is it? And I'm like, ma'am. We just don't have fish. And the door opens again, and the third lady never even got to step foot in because the first two ladies turned right around and went, they're all sold out of fish. <laughs> and this is a fish story. Here's the thing. I think they were trying to speak it into existence. They wanted some fish on the wind nuts menu. I think that's what they want. You know, and I'm shopping, and I see something on the shelf that's not there. I wish I could wheel it into his But, um, uh, yeah, in... I won't eat fish right now. The boys are doing it for a while here, so I'm not sure where it is right now, but it is the perfect time of year for that show. Alicia, um, this time of year at Wing Nuts, you got your, your green shirt on here. What's it like for, for you inside all of these restaurants you guys have now uh, as you guys celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Well, right here, it's beautiful. I mean, we've seen people all day coming in wearing green, wearing orange, wearing girls like me. Um, you know, like a cider dough, but it's great. Um, all fans all wanting to be here. Awesome stuff. Well, Ed and Alicia, thank you so much. Thank you to both of you for giving the gift that keeps on giving. I have them every time. You don't get tired of it. You love it when you guys have them. Thank you. And, and a big shout out to your family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's get Ryan in here. Ryan Talbot. Was fashionably late tonight. <laughs> Tough. Hey, not too much. Excited to be here, man. Okay, before we get into this show here, why don't you explain these t shirts? If you haven't made up, you texted me this morning and you said, I got t shirts, will you wear one? And I said, All right, send me a picture because. I'm not agreeing to anything before I get a picture. What, what do we got going on here? You know, 316 day, growing up a huge Stone Cold Steve Austin fan. I said, we have to do something with shouting 316 for 316 day. And here it is. Excited to be here. Live show of Wing Nuts. Dying to shout 316 shirts. This has been a big week for, for wrestling in the Shout Podcast. We talked a little bit about The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin on the show a couple of nights ago. Um, Rock is the shout. I think we're I think we're a pro rock podcast. 
I'm, I'm not opposed to that, but Austin was definitely uh, number one for me. Uh, anyway, anyway, anyway. All right, let's get into what everybody came here online and here at Wake House 1402 Motorsport Highway for us to discuss. And I want to start with Stefan Diggs because we cannot get a week, it seems, without Stefan Diggs coming up in some way, shape, or form. I'm getting text messages from Bills fans asking, all right, where is Stefan Diggs getting traded to? He's not getting traded to anywhere, okay? Stay up. I think Stefan Diggs said it back. Stay off the man's Twitter account. He is going to have crypto tweets part of the experience. Ryan, he's on the books for $27 million for 2024. There's an out next year. In 2025, the Bills can move on from Stefan Diggs if they want to. There's a post-June 1st mark where they get $18 million in cap space if they want to move on after this upcoming season. But right now, settle in. Stefan Diggs is going to be on this roster come the opening game in 2024. 100%. And, and, you know, he said it like you said. Stay off my social media. Stay off my Twitter. He'll, he'll post random things. Uh, the last one was well today with three dots. And before that, something, you know, ready for something, ready for anything. Ready for whatever. Yeah, ready for whatever. That does not, everything does not relate to the Bills. Stefan Diggs, you know, marches to the beat of his own drum, so to speak. And uh, don't read it everything you see on social media. All right, where do you want to go next? Where do you want to start? I'll give you, I'll give you the mic today. All right. I usually direct this thing. Yeah. I want you to take it. We went, we went back and forth a little bit with ideas and uh, biggest loss in free agency, man. Let's start there. That's a great question. And, you know, I probably would have said going into free agency that Tyrell Dawson was going to be back in the day. Uh, only because I thought there was going to be a market for him. He signed with the Seattle Seahawks. You don't have the numbers on that contract yet. But I'd imagine it would be outside of the Bills' spending range because, listen, they're paying a lot of money to Matt Milano. They have a starting middle linebacker in Terrell Bernard. So they weren't going to probably break the bank for a backup player. They go out and they bring in Anthony Morrow. And because of that, I'm not going to say Tyrell Dawson. I think that you, know, you can uh, live with him moving on and, and filling that void somewhere else. You know, honestly, the Bill, I'm going to use three guys, and it's not a perfect fit, but you have Linval Joseph, who's in Asia right now. You have Puna Ford, who signed with the Los Angeles Chargers. You have Jordan Phillips, who's still out there. I think that collective, if you go back to last offseason, right here, in Italy Nuts, 12 months ago, we were talking about how much we like those additions. And I don't think that they necessarily met the expectations that we set for them. But if I'm looking at that defensive tackle spot right now, beyond Daquan Jones and Ed Oliver, I'm really concerned about the depth that they have right now. And one guy's off the market. I think Linval Joseph's going to be another year older. And the big problem is they don't have a clear-cut target on the free agency market. There's reports that they're meeting with Sebastian, Sebastian Fields today. Who are, I'm going to be honest with you. He's just a guy. I don't know if you bring him in and you can slot him in, in, in as that number three guy in the defensive tackle rotation. I'm very concerned about this defensive tackle position, and I think it's going to be a major priority in the draft. Yeah, I agree with that completely in terms of the hole there on the roster right now, the depth issues. Uh, Sebastian Joseph, I think he's fine in terms of just yeah, but you're right. I mean, he's not a game changer. He's not someone that you're necessarily going to see uh, fighting for reps or, or taking significant reps away from uh, Ed Oliver, Daquan Jones, anything like that. So the draft is going to be a spot where they have to go in. They have to find someone that they can either be the heir apparent to Daquan Jones, but also be someone that can play significant reps here in 2024. For me, though, Matt, the biggest loss was Mitch Morse. And, you know, you look at the contract, I get it, you get $8.5 million off the books. But then to see him sign for a little over $5 million per year with Jacksonville, uh, if you knew that was the price, could the Bills have agreed to a pay cut with him? Uh, you know, Jacksonville shared this video of all the blocking that he had done here in Buffalo, and that's hard to replace. And, you know, nothing against Connor McGovern, but it's not easy just to move over from guard to center and not miss a beat. And you talk about the chemistry that Mitch Morris had with Josh Allen, the athleticism, the ability to get to that second level on run plays. That is going to be really hard for this team to replace. And it's not just that. Now you have McGovern over to center and David Edwards be that guard. Uh, or are they going to go somewhere else? Are they going to draft someone? Is it going to be someone already 
on their roster. We talk about all the youth and young talent that they have. But now, a strength of this team from one year ago, the O line, there's a lot of question marks in terms of those moves. I'm, I'm very bullish on David Edwards. You know that. I think he's going to slot into that left guard spot and maybe even raise the level of the offensive line as a whole. Because I think o Osiris Torrance in year two is going to be a better version of what he was last year. And I think McGovern was so good. They wouldn't have made this move if they didn't have a great amount of belief in him being able to play center. I think Eric Cromer is super strategic in the way that he makes these kinds of moves on his offensive line. So going into this, knowing that these guys are going to fit into these balls. So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because of the ways that they kind of crafted this thing last year. I want to mention one other guy as, as a big loss. And I kind of downplay it when Leonard Ford signed with the San Francisco 49ers. But they're going to have to replace that, that sack production. I mean, a guy that led the Bills in sacks last season is going to be in San Francisco on a much uh, more expensive contract. I don't think it could have fit in to what the Bills were going to do. But how are they going to replace that? Are, are they going to ask AJ Epinesa to step into a larger role and fill that? Are they going to go out and they, you know, draft a player? Listen, this regime doesn't have a great track record for finding edge rushers in the draft and then having them produce right from the jump. You're gonna need somebody in week one to be able to produce in this division, which I think you can make an argument that all three of these offenses in the AFC East have the chance to be better next season. I'm not counting on it with the Jets. We know we talk plenty about Aaron Rodgers, but they, they made some moves. And they, they, there's a chance that they could be better. You gotta find some production on the edge, whether it's you know that second or third move of the agency or in the draft. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And I do think you'll see an uptick in snaps for Greg Rousseau from AJ Epinesa, which I think is a good thing that uh, if you get Epinesa up to eight sacks, if you can get Rousseau those extra reps as well, I think you'll see more out of him as a pass rusher. And listen, Don Miller is still under contract. Took a pay cut to be here. You've got to get something out of him this year after getting virtually nothing one year ago. So that's where some of the sack production is going to come from. Kingsley Jonathan, another year in this system, can he step up? But I agree with you that there has to be someone. It wouldn't shock me if we see kind of a, a deja vu situation where after the draft with the compensatory, uh, compensatory pick formula, that's all out the window. Maybe there's still a pretty good pass pusher out there, and the Bills can agree with the veteran to come in like that Leonard Floyd rule from one year ago. You know, I want to go next. Let's go to the offensive side of the ball. We spent a lot of time on the Thursday show talking about the addition of Curtis Samuel. And, and interestingly enough, it's been a, a conversation on social media that's been a lot more split than I would have thought because when Freedom Agency was kind of creeping up on us, I felt like a lot of Bills fans were reaching out to us on the insider text line, on social media, and talking about this is a player that a lot of them wanted, right? I don't know if the, the appetite for Curtis Samuel was, was as robust as I thought when this when this signing happened. I wrote a story, it's up at Syracuse.com today, you can read about my five thoughts and I graded the signing. I gave it an A minus uh, because I like so much about what it means. But we're, we're gonna bring a friend up here in a minute to talk about it. Before we do, I wanted to kind of dive into the comparison between Curtis Samuel and Gabe Davis. Because Gabe Davis leaves on a three-year deal worth $39 million with Jacksonville. And Samuel comes in on a much lesser deal. Two, three years, $24 million. That's a pay cut for Samuel, who in Washington a couple of years ago got three years and $34 million. What are your thoughts on like the skill sets and how they compare between Samuel and Davis? Well, so first and foremost, let me back up just a little bit. I think it's a win for Gabe Davis to be in Jacksonville, reunited with Chad Hall, back at home, a fresh start for him because in Buffalo, expectations could never reach what the Bills fans wanted out of him after the playoff game against Kansas City. Right or wrong, the expectation after that game was – this guy is going to be a star for the offense, and it never happened. He, he would disappear some games. He would get targets sometimes. He had some frustrating drops. So I think a fresh start for Gabe Davis, first of all, is great for him. But speaking of fresh starts, this is an ideal fit for Curtis Samuel. Very rarely do players get to join a new team, get a pretty decent payday at that, and enter a system that you already know. He has played with Joe Brady. His best system in, or his best season in the league came in 2020. 800 plus yards receiving, 200 plus yards 
rushing, uh, looked great in that mold. And you know that he, he's going to have a role here, and it's going to be exactly what he probably is already envisioning. It might be a flanker. It might be where he is playing a, uh, out of the backfield, getting some carries. He is going to be a Swiss Army knife for this offense, a much better version of what maybe Isaiah McKenzie was a few years ago in terms of that role. But I, I see him fitting into this offense seamlessly. I, I see him really stepping up and playing a big role in helping this team and this offense maybe. Uh, in terms of the separation and burst that he provides, which were big issues for this offense. All right, let's bring in a friend of the program, a buddy of ours for a long time, Mr. Joe Miller, uh, host of the Overreaction Buffalo Bills podcast. It's great. Yeah, don't go anywhere. I see we're all dressed for St. Patrick's Day. We are. We are. <laughs> Um, we, we have the, we have the all black motif. You can never go wrong with black. I got the memo. Yeah. No, thank you. Totally got the memo. It was great to see you out here tonight. You were at you were at a podcast a couple months ago. We didn't, didn't get a chance to link up with you on the show. When you walked in here today, I'm like, perfect. Because you had a tweet, I think this morning? Was it yesterday? Uh, it was a couple days ago. A couple days ago? Okay. That I just got to have a conversation with you about. So you said that Curtis Samuel, after he was signed, is giving you major Jameson Crowder vibes. I didn't say major. I, okay. just, said, I just said the Curtis Samuel signing gives me Jameson Crowder vibes. I'm going to give him there that was just kind of like, meh. Right? Okay. This, this, so the signing is meh. And this is perfect. Not, not the signing was meh. Just the feeling was just kind of like, I've, we've done this. We've done this. Right. So take me into it. Take me into the thoughts. And, and the funny thing is, is on social media, Twitter specifically, I'm getting ran a lot. They're not the same player at all. And it's like, no, they're not the same player. They're the same as clearly more gifted athletically. He's a bigger player. He's a lot faster. But when you look at what the Bills are trying to do, or what they tried to do with Jameson Crowder, you get the same, and it's effectively replace that Cole Beasley production, right? They're trying to find that slot guy that's super slippery, that can like get yard separation, which is the same rule can, uh, very similar to what Cole Beasley could. And it's just, it's just when you look at the players in that format, it just was kind of like we've been down this road. And there's an aspect of you brought Cole Beasley back at one point and then didn't do the Cole Beasley thing, right? Because when he came back, we were like, oh my God, that's going to happen. They're gonna they're gonna do it again. Like Cole Beasley's gonna be the thing that makes this whole thing go. And then they're like, uh Cole, just stay over there. Like don't don't come off the bench. And it just feels like they're trying to fit this guy in. I believe I hope that it works. But he's what a seven year player, this is eight years, he's not exactly young. Cole wasn't young when he got here either. And, but there's been some injury things in there, just like with Jameson Crowder. And to me, there's just an aspect of like, if, if you're looking for a, if, if we pulled the room right now, the Bills fans, how many of them in this room or even watching online are going to tell you, I was expecting and hoping the Bills would sign Curtis Samuel? Based on my mentions, I'd say it's higher than you think, but I, I, don't know I think it's low enough to where I get where you're going. And then they sign him, and it's like, oh my God, Curtis Samuel! And it's like, it's kind of like Jameson right? It wasn't the splash, especially for the number, but maybe we were all hoping for. So here's to me where I think it fits perfectly. It's a little bit different than Jameson Crowder, and I'd like your thoughts on this. So at the end of last season, Joe Brady and Nausman was trying to jam the ball screen into this offense. With Stephon Diggs, which I don't think at this stage of his career, he's built to have success at. So I think you bring in a guy that's already done that in his offense back in 2020. I think you're going to have to evolve the offense. It's going to look a little bit more like the offense in Carolina. Like what Joe Brady ran last year was a version of Ken Dorsey's offense, which was a version of Brian Daigle's offense. So now we have to talk about how much is that going to change over the next nine months? And how much is Curtis Samuel the guy that they think, okay, he's versatile enough and fast enough. But I think he's faster than Isaiah McKenzie, who I think, honestly, Isaiah McKenzie at his greatest moments, and I think about the Patriots game and the Dolphins game, where I felt like, okay, do that with that guy more. I think that's what Samuel can be. The question is, to your point, can Brady get him? That's what it, to, at that moment, you have to get him. I want to back up to the bubble screen thing. Because the bubble screen thing is a wild annoyance to me because it's not a matter of Stephon Diggs. It's not a matter of who's catching the football. The problem is the Bills can't block ball screens. 
I had the opportunity and the privilege to have Steve Pastor on one of my shows. And I said to Steve, I was like, you know, one of the things that drives me crazy is the fact that he successfully run bubble screens against us this was two years ago all the time, which is amazing to me. And he finished my sentence. He said that we can't run a bubble screen. And I don't know that Curtis Samuel fixes that problem. Unless they figure out how to get these guys to block when they're out of space, I mean, it's going to be just more of the same. But going back to even what you just said as far as offensively and morphing this offense and like getting it to, to transform into something else. Coming off of this past year, we saw the Bills run the ball more effectively. James Cook was impressive. Ty Johnson was impressive. The Bills, we finally got the run game that we wanted. And as much as everyone was heralding it and excited about it, everybody that I asked, what would you rather have? The 2023 offense or the 2020 offense? Everybody goes, the 2020 offense. Who gives a crap about morphing and transforming? We know what Josh Allen does and what Josh Allen does well. Let's do that. And that's a valid point because of what we saw during that time and the way that he broke out. But at, at the same time, I would think that Joe Brady probably sat there and said, here is exactly what I'm going to do to utilize his skill set. And we saw him unlock him as a runner a little bit more. So that's step one. Those are things that he could do last year despite not having his offense. So I think that with the full offseason and having the interview process, probably getting Josh Allen and everyone on board with it as well, I think you're going to see maybe a little bit of what happened in 2020 in terms of that offense. But you're also going to see a blend of what he was able to do in Carolina where he had Teddy Bridgewater and he was able to have, you know, a few thousand yard receivers and, you know, there's no Christian McCaffrey in this offense, obviously, but James Cook can help in that regard as well. I think the biggest thing about the, if Brady, to your point, can unlock Josh Allen to get him back to some of that 20, 20, 20, stuff. The biggest thing, and obviously the, the content that I do is, is different than the content that you guys do. If you guys are professional journalists, I'm a fan. Like, right? So for me, it's about the emotion of the fan. And what I always drag it down to is in 2020 and 2021, when it was third and nine, third and 12, third and 15, third and 22, and Josh Allen dropped back and cut the ball loose, you knew somebody was on the other side and about to catch it. Why are we living in a world with Josh Allen where it's third and six and we're nervous? Can they get it? Third and ten, and you're like, I don't know. Can they, can they get it? Like, let's get back to what he did well, right? To your point. If Brady can unlock that, and he did unlock the running piece, why would Dorsey not run Josh Allen? But, Listen, I'm not a film guy. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't trust the film, but I do think there is something to the fact that teams have literally been scared into taking a deep part of the field away. Now, I think you can push back on that to your point that Stephon Diggs had a wide open deep ball in the playoff game. Trent Sherfield had a wide open deep ball in the playoff game. Opportunities are there to be had. Guys have to make plays. And so that kind of shifts my focus. And I'm going to thank you your contribution today. Give it to Joel Miller right here with some great uh chatter to check them out over on Twitter. We're at, at Joe Miller Wire. There it is, Joe Miller Wire. Uh let's get up uh our next guest here. Come on in Mark. So I want to introduce Mark here. I think this is we've probably done what 13, 14 live shows at Wingnut. I think Mark has been at 80 to 90 percent of them. And he's even been at, at our show out in Syracuse, or Verona, and we did it at, at the turn. So he's one of our insiders, our South Park Bowl Bills insiders, and making his shout in person debut. He's already been on the, mentioned on the show uh, in, in other ways. I want to say thank you to start off. And uh, how are you? Doing great, man. Uh, Big drive in from Syracuse. Uh, always worth the first man. Uh, Wings are always awesome. And, uh, First time on the show. So I wanted to bring you on. That was a perfect jumping off point. We talked about the offense and what it needs to look like and uh, the early feedback on Curtis Samuel. And that kind of pushes, okay, Curtis Samuel, if it doesn't move the needle for you, maybe then it's about what are you going to add in the draft. And that's where you come in, my friend, because you have a take about how this thing should go next month. I mean, I'm excited about the uh, Samuel signing. Uh, I think that'll take a lot of pressure off Stephon Diggs and not get through as he does fast. And it might be confusing defenses, but just so used to what goes on in the group of people that are off that right now. But we'll get to see where the front went. Come to Buffalo. 
And we would love to see uh, that grab pick happen. So we maybe see the first round. She's on the second round, take that the second round. So you need an error. Somebody is going to be the error parent to step on things because you know it's not really going to happen. That's going to be my. And uh, we just want to take this spot. I really like to take, uh, and I think at 28, it's going to be really interesting right, with what they do. Because I think there's so much in play. Maybe getting up a few spots if you really fall in love with a guy like Franklin. Maybe a Brian Thomas out of LSU falls to the range and you want to get up and get him. There's going to be opportunities to do that. There's, there's like a, a handful of guys that are really interesting. The more you watch A.B. Mitchell, uh, Xavier Wharton out of Texas, both really interesting skill sets. How much do you still put emphasis on receiver early in the draft after they got close over? It is such a deep draft. And here's where it gets tricky, though, Matt. You look at the start of the draft. You have the Bears finally trade away Justin Fields. And now you're sitting there you're saying first three picks are probably going to go quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. But the next three are going to probably be wide receivers. So by the time you can get out of the top ten, you could have four receivers gone, um, three receivers in the top tight end gone, and that's just going to push more receivers in those teams. Can the Bills realistically move up high enough to get a Brian Thomas Jr.? Probably not, because he would be number four in my eyes for that wide receiver ranking. So if you are going to prioritize that at 28 or move up a few spots, you have to determine, is that still better than a defensive lineman? That will probably be a better overall player or, or in terms of draft stock. Uh, even a safety, which I got huge on safety. I know. Stop it with the safety talk. I know. I don't want to hear safety in round one or two anymore. Fair I enough. Push you back, and you can go read Ryan's latest mock draft, which has a safety. In round two. In round two. Is the first pick the Bills make? Yes, it is. Get out of here. You, got, you are in a one minute timeout, Ryan Salvin. I hate it. No, but seriously, he gave, a good, he gave a good safety. I would understand it. But still, 40. It feels like we're in a different world where that just feels too early for us. And, and that's certainly fair, too. But you look at what they've done so far in free agency, and that, everything kind of goes back to wide receiver. But at safety, they bring back Taylor Rapp. If you listen to Cam Lewis on his uh, meeting with the media, he made it sound like there'd be an opportunity for him to possibly play uh, as well. And are you comfortable with that as your, your safety duo to start the year? I personally yes. wouldn't be Yes, I am. I personally would not be. It has nothing to do with the fact that I'm a UV alum. It has nothing to do with that. A uh, little bit of bias showing there. All right, Mark. Uh, so tell me, final take here. What do you think the Bills do in round one next month? That's a wide receiver. That's a wide receiver. Love it. I want to see that. And we need a speed in this season. I know Samuel's got the 4 3 40 speed, but in one I don't want to see the they got enough weapons. He follows me on Instagram. I, I put out that ESPN. How scary would it be if Xavier was in that uh, lineup? But here's the thing about him, too. It's interesting. I don't know. I think Hollywood Brown kind of takes them out of wide receiver. I think it takes them out of wide receiver in round one now because there's going to be some need. they got to get on the quarterback trade. They're going to probably trade uh, Legereus Sneed. They might want to start building in the quarterback room. I don't know if they have the luxury of going wide receiver in round one, especially if there's a run out of it, like you said. Got a couple, get a couple more people on here. Listen, we talked about you coming on today. You were a little nervous. I got to tell you, 10 out of 10 performance, my friend. That was great stuff. Give it up for Mark. You killed it. Go Bills. There you go. There you go. All right, who do we got coming on next? What about Mark? We got a whole crew here. Hey, nice. Come on in, come on in. Charlie, right here. All right, so introduce yourself first. My name is Mike. Uh, I'm here tonight with my family and my wife, Nicole, who already left. My oldest, Salvatore, is in the back. We got Leo and Scarlett. You probably just hear it. here, but showing you the whole gamut of your fan base, the Bills fan base from, you know, old to young. That's awesome. So we were talking about the show, and you were coming to Lane Nuts, but you changed the reservation so you can come off the show. We really appreciate that. So what are you bringing on the show? Give us give us your hottest take here. Awesome. Well, a little background on that. Uh, Shout Podcast is part of the normal rotation, so I got to show them the faces behind the voices when we're in the car or we're doing work around the house or whatever. Um, Scarlett, my youngest, got to go to her first Bills game this season with the, the Bucks primetime games. So we're really, you know, bringing up that next generation of the Bills. 
course, the off season now, we're deep into that. Uh, oh man, it, there's so much to digest. It's almost like sit back and just watch how everything falls because it, it's busier than it's ever been in this off season. Uh, any special takes that really, there's just too much to, to look for. Uh, the safety in the first round, I don't know about that. <laughs> it was the second round, I'll give oh, second, that. Okay, but good. less if even second round. Second round's okay because you're not stuck with that first round contract and option and the high value for that, that sort of over saturated uh, position in the market right now. So there's I've never seen a more divided fan base on the head coach in year seven. Like I've seen a lot of stuff and I've and I'm awful. I should not be on Facebook looking at anything. But I post my stories in a lot of these Facebook groups, so I end up seeing a lot of the commentary. And I've seen some just ludicrous Sean McDermott slander over the last couple of weeks. And the one thing I would push back for people that aren't fans of Sean McDermott is like, what is the one thing he really does well? He coaches up safety and cornerbacks, right? And he gets the most out of defensive backs. So if you're in that situation and you're going to develop players, maybe not always top tier talent, I don't think you need to spend an early draft pick on that position. That's one of the benefits of having that guy as your coach. I would agree with that because uh, it's been proven that even in the middle of the season or people traded like Boyer and I several years ago, he was able to trade those people up and he has the strength of a coach to do that with those players. Yeah, will it help have an elite person draft in that position? Sure, but I think he's got the talent. He's got, now he's got even more experience as a coach for the last what, seven years now. He was eight years, I believe, going into it. Uh, he's going to have the ability to get that part of the defense, this deep secondary like that, up to play, allowing them to focus on the draft capital or other free agents in more critical upfront positions, particularly a defense style with all the a free agents who just lost on their defensive squad line. Like that for example, that's the big position that we're talking about. Like bringing the family out and bringing the fire on shout. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. It is hot in here. All right, Mike, and then we'll go. We'll go you next. Mike, we'll go Mike, and then you. Okay. Come on up, Mike. Please. All right, we got the legend himself, Michael Partho. Um, where can people find you nowadays? I, I see you popped up with a few all over the place. Uh, train wreck sports. We usually have a uh, wrestling pro wrestling TV podcast. Uh, Saturday night time is just WWE or AEW is up on that. And right now we have a regular Tuesday evening show around six six thirty to go to WrestleMania, which I know you're looking forward to. Morning is coming, Brian. I hope you're on that episode because I'm coming. I've never, I've never been on the wrestling. Oh no, I think I did a good one year. I'm coming on the wrestling. You've probably gone on the wrestling show more times than he has. He's in our chat. What's the deal? Owen wants a lot of the time on that show, so I'm kind of off on the side. Got to let him shine a little bit. All right, Mike, right, bring it to us. What's your uh, hottest Bills take of the moment? Well, I've got a question for you guys. Uh, Curtis Samuels, the recent uh, big wide receiver addition. You guys went over the line on your, your last podcast. Uh, he's a very versatile guy, very. Uh, uh, Cash, Swiss Army sort of guy. We play with the side, we play him outside. He might be, if we can get some blocking going, he might be useful on a bubble screen or a jet sweep once in a while. Maybe he's actually had success. If we really like the order, maybe he doesn't have one. Uh, he's had success under uh, Joe Brady before. Uh, especially with, I believe, 850 was in the 150 rushing on top of that. Joe Brady's going to have all off season to work on his own offense and all that going into the season. So my thought is, how much can we expect out of Curtis Samuels compared to previous uh, Buffalo Bills wide receiver courts, specifically like your things with uh, John Brown and uh, Cole Beasley type of uh, court? So I think it's interesting because one of the things I'm thinking about as you're, you're going through Curtis Samuels' like, pitch, like uh, accomplishments, I feel like the Bills have really been trying to chase that like Devo Samuel role for the player. And I think, I don't want to put too much on Curtis Samuel, but I think he's the closest version to that that they've been able to, they've been able to bring into their offense. I think this has the, the potential to be really good because I think for all these years, you, you mentioned a big three there, I think you can go to Gate Davis, Sanders, and Diggs for a big three ish there. I know Davis kind of a slightly later in that year. Then you had uh, Dave Davis here, Diggs last season. Now I think it's going to be Samuel, should be Samuel Diggs and a rookie, 
And then Khalil as your number four kind of like hybrid guy who can do multiple things with. And then I know Bill Coffey is ready for this Justin Shorter to just take the world by storm. Listen, I, I, who knows what's going to happen with Justin Shorter? We'll wait for the preseason training camp to see what that has. I happens to be, but I think I'm a lot more high on Samuel than our friend Joe is. And I think that he brings the, the difference between him and guys like Crowder and Juju, they're as good as they are as separators. Samuel has the highest speed that I think takes him to another level. We'll find out. Yeah, I, I think you utilize him with getting the ball off quickly from Josh Shannon to, to Samuel and see what you can do from there. But the one thing I'll say in terms of the comparison to the Brown, Bees, and the Diggs days. There's more models to feed right now in Buffalo. It's not just the receiving core. You have Delvin Kincaid entering year two coming off of the year, which he shattered Bill's tight end records. You have James Cook, who is utilized as a receiver. So I think he's a great fit for this offense. He's going to have a big role. His stats at the end of the season might not look as gaudy, though, as some of the players in those previous offenses because there's just so many other players that are going to get the ball in their hands at times. And, you know, they're still Austin and Knox, too. And there's so many guys here in this system, so many playmakers that I think it's 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 not a problem to have three mouths to feed. But you're not going to see those stats maybe similar to what we saw in 2020 with the top two, top three players. And let's throw another piece into this, right? Like, when you talk about assembling, like, uh, as good of a arsenal of weapons as possible. The Bills have been really lucky, knock on wood, with Stefan Diggs over the last couple of years not getting into it. If we were to miss any kind of substantial time, like they're going to need to find a really good young receiver, pair him with all these young players that are currently on the roster. I think that would probably fall off the paid into much more of a maybe even 1A, 1B kind of like. Um, Guy in this offense, and he's not going to be asked to be in year two. I'm still higher on Kincaid's upside, even with all this talent that I think most people probably would be. But they have so many different options for what this offense can be, and they have an offseason to figure out what it's supposed to look like. As far as I'm concerned, I'm all for the wide receiver train. Jeremy White is not coming here. I'm not going to get woo woo. We got to get wide receiver number one. We got to get our wide receiver number one in the future because we don't know how many years of good production we have left in the last days. But we got to think about the John Taylor future because we've got many more years with this club. And he's going to be that one guy that's going to draw all the attention to be able to count on him. Get up for Michael Parker. Great stuff, buddy. Yeah. See you in a couple weeks. Yeah. All right, we got one more from the audience coming up. Come on in. Over almost 1,500 watching live tonight. We got the numbers up big right now. Hit that like button on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel as well. We really appreciate you guys watching on all the different platforms. All right, so give yourself a big introduction. How are you? I'm Earl Wells, and I'm a big couple of Bills fan. Nice. All right, what, you, what do you want to bring to the show? What do you want to talk about? Well, I've got a lot of draft. I mean, I would like love to draft Xavier Worthy. I think our offense would look really speedy, and we'd be steely good against the defenses like Kansas City. And I want to beat them this year in the playoffs, too. All right. Did you watch him a lot of Texas? Did you watch Xavier Worthy a lot of Texas? I watched his highlights. He looks pretty fast. That's what people are saying all over Twitter. Ryan, right, the one thing with, with Worthy that's interesting for me is that I think he projects as like a slot player. Oh, oh my God. And the Bills just added Samuel. They have Julio Shakir. I think a lot of people make the argument that Stefan Diggs' future is kind of the slot. He played over 40% of snaps the last three games of the season in the slot. What do you think about the potential Xavier Worthy traffic for the Bills that doesn't fit the offense? So, Worthy does have game breaking speed. I mean, what is that? 428? 429? No, 421. 421? Yeah, he's set the combine record. Take, take, take Worthy. <laughs> yeah, so he had the combine record this year that had been previously set. I do really think that from the speed aspect of it, he could be someone where it's just Josh Allen throw it up and let him go and get under it. The big thing with him, though, is his frame, his size, in my opinion. Um, in, in the NFL, you know, for many years, teams shied away from players that were under 180 pounds because you take a few hits, you take a few licks, and, and you're on the IR, you're in for a few weeks here. 
Uh, but we've also seen the last few years some smaller receivers really produce in offenses and that it's maybe not that way anymore. So if that is the best player available at 28 and the Bills really do feel that high about him, I'm not opposed to it. But then it, you have to have a plan to utilize this to get him onto the field so that way he is a different fit for this team in 2024 and beyond. What other wide receivers do you like? And are you of the thinking that it's wide receiver at 28 or above? I would like to pick receiver play. I like the receivers we have right now. I mean, Curtis Samuel is a great signing. I think he'll be like Cole Beasley, and he's better than Gabe Davis. I feel like because his catch rate is better than Gabe Davis's. And I, that's why I found what I saw his catch percentage like in the 50th for me, but I saw Curtis Samuel in the high 60s. And I think this year, it might be a 70% catch from quarterbacks running his way. And, and, and Curtis Samuel gets to play with the best quarterback in his career right now. It's good for him. Well, thank you so much for taking some time coming on the show. We appreciate you. We'll see you at a future one. Thank you. Let's give it up. Yes. All right, Ryan. Where do you want to go next? We're going to finish this show off here. I'll give you the, I'll give you the wheel. Yeah, so uh, I guess where we go next is the, the second wave of free agency, Matt. Not specific players, but do you think this is an area where the Bills are going to be active with free agent visits, a few signings, or is this something where maybe now our ship, for the most part, changed the draft? You know, I think that that second wave is still going to be interesting to watch because the Bills have been a little bit quieter than a year ago, and there's they're losing more players than they did last year. So I think that Brandon Bean's always going to try to be aggressive to fill any holes, and there are holes in the secondary. I don't know if you're going to bring in a, just, a, a, a Justin Simmons. I know everybody you know, is hoping for that, and that they can somehow find a way to get the money for that at the safety position. I think there's some other guys out there that I think that they can protect Mike Edwards in the way that they throw it around. Maybe on the lower end, I thought Cam Earl, you see that contract in uh, LA, and then you start to wonder, okay, did the Bills not think that he was a fit for the kind of player that he wants to really want? Us? Check this out on it. There's different flavors of safety, right? Like Taylor Rapp to me is the heir apparent to Jordan Floyd. It's why when they brought him back, it made more sense why they were so willing to move on to Jordan Floyd and play the game in a similar way. I don't think Cam Earl necessarily is a fit as like a strong safety, a guy over the top that asked him to play the deep part of the field. I think that's more Cam Lewis, even though know, his career highlight against Justin Jefferson will probably tell a different story. Um, but I think that he's going to do work there. I think they could probably still add a running back, uh, but I, I think they'll be after that defensive line as well. Yeah, I agree. Defensive tackle, though, is fitting out very quickly. I mean, there are a few options beyond players that you're bringing in and you're not guaranteeing them necessarily a roster spot. You're saying they come and compete, but safety, you're right. Justin Simmons is still a big name out there on the market. Uh, Andre Dix, I believe, is still uh, available, makes sense to a certain extent for this team. Uh, but there's also some good guys to be had in this year's draft class as well. If you can get day two, early day three. So that might be the game plan with 11 picks. They could package some of those day three picks together to move up and, and get a guy earlier on day three or later on day two. So I don't think they're pressing, but you're right. You at least have to evaluate the market, try to address some of these needs. There's still some pretty good backs out there too. But I think Simmons would at least be that name that fans would covet. Be really happy if you were able to sign in. You'd say, All right, let's pack it in for the most part until the draft and see where the chips fall after that. There's a report out a couple days ago that free agent defensive tackle TR Charge is busy in the Bengals right after they signed Sheldon Rankin. But I feel like if you're the Bills, you're paying attention to that. I don't know if the money's necessarily in the range they want to spend, but if you think about Eric Armstead from the San Francisco 49ers. Goes and signs a free agent contract with Jacksonville Jaguars. The Bills were in on him. So I think if you're not at least making a call to Tart to see if he's he's probably to me the, the top guy that's on uh, the free agent market at this point left with defensive tackle, I, I think you at least want to have a conversation with that. Joseph Davis uh, doesn't do it for me. I mean, he's a guy that was cut last year. I know he was a captain for them. If he ends up being your fourth or fifth defensive tackle, fine. Another idea is what about like moving Shaq Lawson inside the defensive tackle and bringing him back on a one year deal as maybe like a fringe compete for a loss spot? I don't know how much more of a future he has on the edge. And I agree with that, but man, that, that's just very tough to expect him to be able to come in and take on a defensive tackle role, bulk up, 
uh, learn, you know, the, the nuances of that position as well. So it, it'll be a wait and see for me in that. I still think there's some pure defensive tackles on the market in the draft. But maybe that would be a post draft move where we'll bring you in to compete at edge. We'll, you know, we'll let you see if we can just make this roster as a whole. Uh, as we move you up here, we're going to bring in uh, one of the owners of Wing Nuts, AJ Giordano, who opens up the doors to us every month. Uh, the goat here himself. Get out of here in the middle, man. Woo! Not much. I want to. I know. I know you got a hot pills take to throw out here. You got the apron on. You make the wings all night. Just wearing every hat. That's good because otherwise, you know, you get you know, bring it off that dome here. Shine up. It is shine up. Who's, who, who, who makes it look better? You or Tell? Tell is. I think he's got a. Nice point at the top right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so give me your hottest Bills take right now. Hottest Bills take is everybody's forgetting about Justin Fuller. He went into the offseason working out hard. He's getting ready to run. He's going to blow by people with six foot five. He's a freak athlete. I think we have our ass. So, what I really like about this take, if it ends up materializing, is that he's a guy that comes in as a former, like, I mean, stud high school athlete. He's one of the top three guys. Yeah. Comes into college, never really works out, gets to the NFL, gets to kind of sit back and watch year one. And I think that there might be a little juice there. And maybe, you know, if the Bills don't go wide receiver in round one or round two and they're not aggressive, maybe that says something about what they think about shorter. I agree 100%. I think that uh, our coaches know what they're doing. I think they're happy where they are. They know what they have in the locker room. I definitely think we need to add some weapons on offense, but I think primarily defense, safety, defensive line, defensive line, I think they're going to do our priorities. Are you, have you moved off at all? Like I've seen it, there's a little bit of this out there right now in terms of all the Bills are, are losing the arms ranks. They're, step, they're taking a step back. They're not as much of a contender as they've been in recent years. Do you feel that at this stage? Do you think with the level traffic next month and what's on the roster right now, there's enough? We got number 17 at the home, bro. So we're never out of it. We're going to run some straight back to the playoffs, hopefully the Super Bowl again this year, and I think we're going to crush everybody. I think uh, we're going to reload. We might uh, have a rough beginning of the season. We're going to be each other out, and I think the coach will get everybody to, you know, gel together just in time for a playoff push. Uh, you heard it right there from the man himself. We got 1,700 people watching live right now across all three platforms, and I want you to tell them what they need to know about Wicca. Wicca's got coming up over the next couple of weeks. Sauce and crunch is all I really need to know. Biggest, crispiest, juiciest flames we're going to get. Um, we got a couple of cool specials. The Stoffies, the New Jersey Prime, the Chili Puppet, the Mozzarella Sticks, Matcha Sauce, and more warm cheese. What about those people with the sweet tooth? What do you got right now for the desserts? We got a Snickers cheesecake and a Brian Sauce. We're looking at Snickers. Honey, did you already order that? Because uh, we're going to get after that right after this. And which is right now. Thank you to everybody here at Wing Nuts. Come on out any night, any time of day. Make sure they're open first. 1402 Miller Sport Highway. Uh, what's the other location? Croft, 700 Military Road. I've already forgotten it. Uh, the address. They're both unbelievably amazing. Get yourself a great drink. Get yourself a great wing. Wing Nuts, the place to be. Take care, everybody. Woo! Go, bro.